Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming to a very special celebration of a very special man. This is one of the most faithful people that I think you will ever know. Um, quiet to himself, but very truly gifted with a love for the Lord and desiring that love to be permeated into everything that he did and with everyone that he did it. Uh, he was always quiet. It, well, maybe when he was mad. <laughs> but uh, quiet nonetheless. Uh, we, we enjoyed uh, all the times we got to spend with him and work with him and to see him in his faithful endeavor to not only work hard, but also to be a person that exudes God in all things. So I want to start with uh, uh, just a, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is a verse that he picked to, to begin this because uh, he wants this to be a celebration. So um, we'll read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. To be asleep in Jesus means to be in a state of passing to eternity. A person who has direct relationship with Jesus Christ. And there is no doubt in my mind that Viva had that relationship. And, and so the Bible goes on and says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, there's not a set number, and only so many are going to get in. And so since he, Viva passed, he might not make it. No, that's not the way God works. If he has you, he has you forever. And you're his. In fact, the Bible goes on and says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, the scripture is very clear. God will come with a trumpet. Viva is already in the presence of Almighty God in his spirit and his soul. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But there will come a day when the trumpet will sound and Viva's body will be raised up, incorruptible, all new, with no sin marks and no struggles of the past and everything ready to be in eternity with God. And then he's going to meet the Lord in the air with us, those of us who remain and haven't passed yet, and will get to enjoy eternity with Viva, but most importantly, with God. That's what the promise is. And that's what we want you to see today as we think about this dear man. I remember seeing a man that in his 60s was still doing hay at a level at which in my 25 to 30 years old, he was making me feel like I was old. <laughs> Okay, you know, Bobby one time couldn't come, and we were trying to help put away some hay, and, and uh, you know, he was bringing in the tractor, and he's pulling in the hay, and, and, and Hank's down there throwing it up, and I'm like, why is Bobby not here? What's he doing today? And, you know, I had a couple of teenagers from the church, and he's sending them up there, and one of the teenagers starts mouthing at Hank. <laughs> oh I can hear Viva tell him not too much. As, as it comes up the, the, you know, the chute there, it comes up with a, a bale, a bale, and another bale on top. A bale, a bale, and another bale on top. He would say, not too much, just the rest of the trailer, Dad. <laughs> and then when he gets up there, you hear him say to the boy, is that enough for you? <laughs> but see, here's Viva down there. He just smiles and shakes his head. He enjoyed it. <laughs> he, he enjoyed it. And then it's, uh, maybe you ought to come down and eat some grapes. That was his favorite thing to do after, after uh, uh, picking and throwing those hay bales all over the place. You know, it was a lot of fun doing those things with him. It's a great thing to be tied together, to be family, 
to be a part of things. And I felt like I was always a part of Viva's family. A, a great close friend, someone that had relationship like he had with Jesus. And so the first song that was chosen, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Let's stand together and sing.
It's a privilege to represent so many cousins and cousins of cousins and to be here. It's a privilege to say a few words, memories of my uncle. Who was my uncle Viva? I have known him my whole married life. Matter of fact, I was only four, but I was at his wedding, and I remember his wedding in 1960. Uh, our families, uh, the Elbersma family, and his, uh, we've been close and distance, both in New Jersey and here. There were so many doings together, and of course, both farming, so so much in common. Matter of fact, we even moved together from New Jersey to here only a day apart. Uh, we on the 28th of uh, March, 72, and they on Howie's birthday, the 29th. I always thought of my Uncle Viva as a strong man. Not the tallest of my uncles, but strong. And of course, you can see that in the sons as well. I also knew that he was the most handsome of all the uncles. <laughs> Should I say it's in the sons too? But, I <laughs> <laughs> but he was the youngest of the uncles on uh, the Vanderway uh, attachment there, and he's the last. And so, his, with double uh, tears that I have to recognize, a generation is passing, and, and the uh, keepers of that Dutch culture. Are we still Dutch? <laughs> we have the hard heads, I know that. Okay. We have a, such a flood of memories and even humorous moments. And uh, one that goes way back, I think this was before he was even married, that he was getting to know his future brother in laws, and my father was involved. And uh, they did a very Dutch thing they went eel fishing in the Pequest River, New Jersey. And you do eel fishing with nets. And you do it uh, as the sun is going down, it's getting dark and all that. And uh, I don't know exactly which uncles were there, but my father told me that uh, uh, Bieber was only uh, a little time in America at that point and didn't know everything about America. He loves nature, but uh, there was this critter that came out of the dark and poised himself on a rock. This critter had this dark ring around its eyes. And it, <laughs> My big uncle Viva that scared him. He met his first raccoon. <laughs> uh, uncle Viva sometimes did some strange things, and looking back at it, we could laugh. But uh, coming from New Jersey and having to change his uh, tags to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania only required in the back, right? So he left his New Jersey tags on the front. <laughs> Rise from the dead. <laughs> it wasn't 
than angry, he was just, you know, he was very definitive in his, his the sound of his voice. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, he was never bad tempered. I know he could have strong feelings about things, but I never saw him bad tempered, okay? Even and as we have the Oscom clan here too, there was always that week in the summer when the Oscoms invaded Hotel Beerspa. And uh, of course they had to go to Fantasyland in Gettysburg. And coming back from Fantasyland because the afternoon milking had to start, Uncle Viva finds two heifers had somehow gotten into the bottom of the silo. They were skinny enough to get through the door, but after they ate, they were not skinny enough to get out. And I don't know how much Frisian went behind them, but he had to move them around and around in the silo until there was skinniness again. <laughs> um, that story did not filter down to us immediately. I think that there was a cooling off period. <laughs> Uncle Viva's likes and dislikes. He loved flowers, and Tiana did too. And so there was always beautiful flowers, even in the driest summer. There was always beautiful flowers, and I think he enjoyed taking care of things in the retirement years, particularly. He disliked salads. <laughs> <laughs> he had no appreciation for the value of salads. He loved pudding, and I learned from him what pudding brai, or pudding porridge, was, and he would have that for breakfast, a sort of a thinner version of vanilla pudding, and you knew how to make it just right, and I think even towards the end, that was one of the one things he would still take a little bit. Uh, he loved music, he loved singing. I understand from Etienne, I didn't know this until she just told me recently, that uh, in the early days in New Jersey, when they had left the Sussex Christian Reformed Church, and they were now in the New Christian Reformed Church, because they had moved toward Flanders, uh, Sussex was starting up a choir, and they knew he had a good voice, and they asked him to come and sing with them, and he did for a few months, but then silo filling time came, and you know, just couldn't be. But he loved music. He played uh, brass instruments. I'm pretty sure it was the trombone and maybe it was the trumpet as well. And he was part of the band in his youth in Holland. And uh, later on, when they were celebrating an 80th uh, reunion for that, he, he was able to be there for that. That meant a lot to him. He had a strong attachment to the things of his youth and to his native gospel mayor. Uh, but farming took most of his attention as farming does. He loved all things nature, and uh, even the picture there of him with the falcon that Bobby took, uh, I think with a phone, okay, but I'm glad he did take that. Yeah, What's that? It was stuck in the tree. Oh, it was stuck in the tree, okay. But uh, Viva had a way. Uh, he loved his dogs, his German shepherds, his Dobermans, to make me a little bit nervous. And he had, uh, remember Bridey, the uh, Irish, you know, of that big one? He could put his paws on my shoulders. <laughs> but he was so loving. He loved his dogs. Okay. Um, I think if you were at Anne's uh, dining room, you would see a, a picture of one of the German shepherds lying alongside a doe or a, a fawn or something. Yeah. Uh, he loved his home. He loved his family. So I have two thoughts that I want to pose with you, two thoughts that encapsulate uh, the life example of my Uncle Viva. In his dining room there are many paintings and pictures. One of them has a title underneath it called Almost Home, and home was everything to Uncle Viva. He was a homebody. Although he liked to get away to Florida. He didn't like cold winter. And uh, you know, that's first strange for a Dutch boy not to like cold winter, but he was, uh, he, he loved coming home. He loved being home. Uh, if they did travel at all, it would be back to Friesland. I don't know how many times he got back, but, uh, but that was also home for him too. 
He even did what few farm families would do. Uh, back in the early days when you boys were still fairly young, he sold all the cows and got an RV and they went cross country all the way to the state of Washington. I don't know if he was checking that out, but I think the guys took a whole month or whatever. But that was important. While you were young, as a family, I don't know of many farmers who would have done that. He did that. I was not believe that. Okay. But it was at home. The home life that he and Anne created that he desired most. The hospitality at Hotel Gersma, I think, was unmatched among the relatives. The dinner table. And how many people did you invite to the dinner table all the time? It was always the constancy of family devotion and Bible reading. And even near the end, when of course, the hearing was gone, so much memory was gone. He wouldn't eat unless a prayer of blessing had been spoken. He and Aunt Anne had built a home of welcome and forged a family bond that continues strong to this day, even as the grandsons are men themselves. So the one thing, the one thing is almost home, but now home. But the second phrase that I would leave with you is not complicated. Not complicated. Uncle Viva did not make life complicated. But it was deep. It was deep and it was real. If you knew what you should be doing, then do it. Get it done. Every day there's work that you should do, and you go ahead and get it done. And the boy is done with that for sure. His word, his promises were to be kept. Pure and simple. No one can claim that Uncle Biba left them in his debt. He paid his bills, he met his obligations. And his honesty was not to be doubted. There were times when he had to deal with unfair situations. If you're a farmer and you deal with selling hay or buying cattle, it's not always totally upright. But he was honest. And that's on you too, of course. Part of the proof of what I just said is clearly evident in the sons that he raised, the same characteristics are there. So am I describing an ideal man who had a perfect life? Think about it. He had struggles. He was born in the era just after the Great Depression. He grew up under Nazi occupation. I think he did service with the Dutch military. And he left everything dear to him to emigrate from the Netherlands. A brother and sister would follow. Soon after uh, they were married, I think he had to go back to Holland to uh, secure that to stay in America. He wasn't a citizen yet, but you know, there, that was an iffy moment. He experienced all the ups and downs of farming. And then when he moved to Gettysburg, we moved with us adult children. But you guys were young. Oh, I think you were only four and you were maybe eight, something like that, seven. And I know it wasn't soon thereafter, you and Howie particularly were running chuck wagons and you also say you were adults. <laughs> you were very responsible. There was lots of harm. And he also lost power. He kept on. Life did not stop. He knew hardship. So what did he hold on to? As Pastor Andrew alluded, and we're going to look at that back of the program in just a moment. 
He had his simple but deep, wholehearted and no doubting faith, which had been taught to him in his youth and made to be his own. That is why he would want us to read a part of that teaching, that catechism, he knew so well. Let's look at the back of the program if you have one to share with those around you. The catechism is a series of questions with answers of biblical basis here. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question number one, first and foremost, if you will learn, what is your only comfort in life and death and in death? And the answer that he would have memorized in Dutch. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head, without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact... All things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. My dear cousins and children, all of you. You have the memory and life example of a true faith in his heavenly father that built a real and lasting love of life and family. Such an end result is worth the journey of faith. Thank you, Hank, for providing us wonderful history from beginning to end. Terry, that was a beautiful song that he would have absolutely loved. As we think about He's Still My Soul in this history, I want to bring us back to that most painful moment again. That, that moment when uh, this son that he had prayed for and tried to help through the struggles and the problems and the decisions that he was making, that moment that he received word that he had just been in a bad car accident. What did he rely on? What did he go to? Did it ruin his faith or even rock it? As Hank was just telling you, I'm sure that there were times that it was very difficult. And I didn't come in to his life until well after that time period. But what I will tell you is, he never once wavered on knowing that it was God's timing, exactly what God wanted, and for God's purpose. And I can't tell you the number of times that I was told so many young people came to know the Lord because my son went into eternity. Hardest day of my life, Pastor. But a great day for the kingdom of Christ. You can hear it with his accent, right? You can't do it. <laughs> I want you to think about that as you begin to move through this story that we're reading together that he put with us. As you can tell, we're not doing the normal service here. It's not a couple of songs and a couple of verses and we're done. We're doing what, what he had planned for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Again, think about that moment. The moment that he realizes that his prayers won't be answered in the positive for his son on the earth, but they were answered in the positive in eternity for his son. That's a hard moment. And yet, his faith never wavered. He never struggled that God knew exactly what he was doing. In his weakness, he leaned heavily on the Lord. And that was hard on the rest of the family. 
Mom, of course, she did the same thing. Very, very, very strong in her faith. Able to see the big picture of what God was doing. But God's strength made perfect in that moment of weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Again, not a man that I looked at and said, struggling in his power of Christ. No way. He didn't let the incident ruin his walk. He let him strengthen his faith. Therefore, look at these words that he picked. I take pleasure in infirmities. Again, I've heard him say, it was rough for me, but it was best for happy. It was rough for me, but God did amazing things in it. There were so many that accepted Jesus that wouldn't have been in eternity, maybe. I'm thankful for that, Pastor. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Again, it says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. The one thing, maybe there were more, but the one thing that he couldn't do anything about is one of those defining moments that I think was his strongest. And I think, if I didn't give you any other memory than that, I think it's worthwhile. Because that's who he was. Still praying for the rest of his sons as they struggled through the same struggles, the same desire and why did you do this, God, and all those things. Quietly just pray, pray, and encouraging with those words. Faith was strong. So, the next song that he picks, I think, fits right here. But when all of my labors and trials are over is what, what I have it as, but it's a different name in your hymn book. But that's what they put it down, because that's why uh, I said it that way. Um, but let's uh, sing together. Um, my number, sorry. Number 556. Number 556 in your hymn book. And again, let's stand this same.
The hope of what God guaranteed in the future through the, the, the incident with Howie and the loss of one of his sons that he loved so dearly, all the way down through every part of life. He, he lived this hope. You know, and, and as Hank said, he always kept that at the forefront. I remember the day that they ordered a tractor trailer of hay. That I don't know that you'd call it hay. It was big. It was very light. Um, you picked it up. You okay? They can carry three. Uh, I can carry three. They could carry ten of those. I think they. It was very light. I've never seen somebody. I'm not saying he didn't get a little upset about it. <laughs> okay, but I've never seen somebody to react the way that he did to to struggles like that, where somebody didn't do what they were supposed to do for him. He paid them the right kind of price, and now they've kind of cheated him out of it. And it was an entire tractor load of lousy hay. Okay? And, and what I saw in him was uh, still a happiness. It did not change who he was. Again, I'm not saying he wasn't upset. He was. But I'm telling you that in the midst of being upset, he, again, it did not change who he was or what he thought. And that God must have wanted it this way was almost the attitude you could see on him, even though he was aggravated. As we unloaded that truck very quickly, and it didn't fill the barn very much. And he wished he wasn't putting it in there altogether. I think I heard him say that. <laughs> okay. But his attitude was one of keeping the hope. You know, when we think about hope, the ultimate hope is what he trusted in. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the, through the power of the Holy Ghost. So what, what did God want us to do? He wants us to abound in hope. Let it seep out into every area of our, area of our life. And again, I don't think I've met a, a more positive, uplifting person than Viva. Uh, you know, whether it's, as Hank said, uh, Hotel Viersma, you, you know, anytime I visited, anytime I went to the area, it was stay for lunch, come in for lunch, do you want a snack? Uh, you know, I could be two hours late for lunch and she'd say, the boys just finished. <laughs> well, maybe they did, I don't know, but you, you know what I mean? It's sit down, it's still here. That's what she's trying to tell me. And here he is. Wanting to sit down and talk politics. He loved to talk politics with me. Um, he, he loved to also talk about where the world is. And he liked to show me his pictures of the books and those type of things that he had of, of the Dutch land. A, a history of family members that, that helped to smuggle the Jews. Or, or plates that were hung on the wall or or put into a, a special places, or even so, some of the, the, the different uh, decorations that you typically find in it. He loved to show those things off and talk to us about them, what they meant. You know, he'd tell me um, in Dutch, like the plate that Hank said in Dutch, and then he'd explain it to me. I love listening to him explain <laughs> what, what something means. It, it was never... Um, what I would consider a, a word for word, like three words, three words. You, you know what I mean? He give you an He give you an understanding. He wanted you to grasp the Dutch thing. Well, who was this person? A special man that cared about his homeland, prayed for it regularly, and always trusted in his hope. And so the next song that he picked that we've put into the order here for you is special music. By, by Rita and Terry, they're going to do it for us here, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what he attempted to do in every situation. Turn his eyes to Jesus.
in the military, as, as Hank mentioned. And uh, when we would do special services to honor those who had served, uh, you know, of course, Memorial Day is an American holiday. He, he would tell me no, and we'd tell him, you have to come up here. You, you worked with us. You were an ally. You still get to count. We're still going to celebrate you. Just always humble is another thing that I would say about him. Never trying to push himself to the front. Never trying to be the one that's first in line. It was just willing to serve everybody. And I think so many people from the area have been served by he, his wife, and his boys, and now his grandkids. Uh, you know, willing to do for anyone. And I think it all started with his attitude and his work ethic and idea of the way that things should be done. He did love his homeland, and he did love for others to know about it. But, you know, the thing that I think he loved the most is what we were just playing about, what Rita just did, turn your eyes upon Jesus, and what God did for him. And so, the next verse that, that has been picked is Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. A very important set of verses. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He relied on these verses. When Howie, Howie passed away, he relied on these verses. Nothing. This death can't stop what he had in his heart. It can't finish and undo. I can trust in that. And he relied on it for every part of his life. When the crops went bad, he relied on it. When it's time to sell the farm, and then he wasn't allowed to do different things with the pieces, he relied on it. When the, 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 uh, the things that he put in the ground, it rained too much, and then another year it didn't rain at all, he relied on it. This man always saw himself as safe in the arms of Jesus. And I think that's something special that he wanted us to think about today. So let's sing good old Fanny Crosby hymn, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. You have that one in your bulletin. It's not in our hand. We'll let you stay seated on this one. Sure.
down in your church. But a beautiful song that he loved and uh, loved very much. And he's trusting in right now, which brings us to the next thing that I want to talk about. I kind of mentioned this already, but I believe that he wants me to give to you the understanding of what it means to be safe, to be saved, to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The idea is that if you die today, like Mr. Biba, would you spend eternity with God in heaven? Would you have the guarantee that I know that I'm going to be with Jesus? Because Mr. Biba had that. The Bible says in 1 John that these things are written that you might know. He wants us to know what the answer is. And the answer is very clear. Salvation is only through one thing, and it's faith of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So we can't work our way to heaven. But according to His mercy, He saved us. The Bible also tells us that all of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So even if I pile up everything good I've done in my life, and Bebo was a good man, it still won't measure up to make him saved. The only thing that would bring him there is what we've already mentioned to you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And I promise you that he believed that with all his heart. There was not a wavering doubt in any part of him on that subject. Okay? But here's the thing. He would want you to know that as well today. He wouldn't want you to leave here and say, I don't know if I'm going to go and spend eternity in heaven. He'd want you to know for sure that if you die on the way home from here or anything else, God forbid, that's not what we want. But if that happens, would they be able to say the same thing about you? That you're in heaven because you took care of what you needed to do with God. You did your business with Him. You have a relationship. It's very simple. It's the ABCs backwards. Confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and cannot save yourself. Believe in your heart that Jesus is God's Son who came to this earth, took our place, died for us, was buried and rose again on the third day, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And accept Him as your Savior. Or ask Him to come into your heart and take away all that sin and give you His righteousness. Folks, that's all you have to do is pray that prayer. I confess, I believe, and I accept. And God tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, for just a moment, if you bow your heads and close your eyes, we haven't even prayed yet. We're heading towards these moments when we will. But for just a moment, if you're sitting here and you say, Pastor, I have never done this but I know I need to take care of it. How about I lead you in a prayer, a, a sinner's prayer, a prayer of acceptance of Christ. And if that is something that you need to take care of, would you just do it with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. I know that nothing I do will be good enough. And Lord, I confess that I need your help. And so I believe that you sent your only begotten Son so that if I believe, when I choose to put my faith in you, I could have eternal life. And Lord, I pray that as I look at the Son who died for me, who paid my penalty, who was buried and rose again and now sits at the right hand of God, Lord, I accept the free gift that he gives us for the wages of my sin. That gift of God, that's eternal life. And I ask you to come into my heart and to save me today. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, as the rest of us are here praying, and as we think about Viva, and as we think about what he means to us, I pray that as we go into the blessing stage of who this man really was, and what he brought to all who came in contact with him, Lord, I pray that you would touch each heart, that we want to be this type of blessing, that we want to open our home in this way, but we also want to have the strong faith, not just something that is a token faith that does church and gives to church and is involved in church, but Lord, really has to change who we are and how we do things. To make it so serious that even, as, as Hank mentioned, even in those moments, Lord, when when you're not able to do everything you always would do before, you still waited quietly for that moment of prayer. And Lord, I thank you for this faith. I thank you for what it brings. And I pray that you would walk uh, with us through our lives with the blessing that you walked with Viva. What a special man this is. 
and what a true blessing it is to have been his friend and a part of those that he included around him. We love you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are looking at now his, his blessing phase. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26 to 31. It says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fail. You've heard already that he loved nature. Okay? This is a man who looked with his eyes and said, look at all the blessings of God. He loved just looking at his farm. He loved looking at those flowers. He loved looking at a good field of hay. He loved looking at good beans. He loved looking at everything in nature. I often wondered, and I teased him about, that, that big old highway right on the edge of his property. And, and, you know, in his famous way, I'm not saying it exactly the way he would, but what do you do? What do you do? It's there, I can't do anything. <laughs> I just try not to pay attention. What do you do? Uh, you know, I would tease him about that. But because he loved that nature and that quiet, you know, and... I think those are very fitting verses for him. But it goes on and says in verse 27, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. God's not here. He's not paying attention. He's not with me. He's not seeing. He's not paying attention to what I'm doing, whether I'm doing it right or not. That is not the way. But the rebuke to Israel was, Why do you say this? Right? And then in verse 28, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. There's no end to it. And I believe Viva looked for that always in nature and in everything he did. The fact that it doesn't end and God is so beyond us. So much more than we could ever imagine. And so when the, the tragedies happen, he is able to see that there's more at play here than just weather and placement. It's God. And I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to trust what He's up to, and I'm going to see Him do something amazing. It goes on and says in verse 29, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, fall. Folks, I think Viva is the most tireless man I have ever met. Like I said, we could be there doing hay, and, and you know, Hank is sending it up to, to Bobby and I and whatever teenager we had with us at the time, and, and Viva's bringing the tractors. He's bringing the loads in and having it ready, and, you know, Hank's like, Dad, I'll get that stop, you know, and no, I'm, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't sit on the side and just watch, even as he got older. And he would quit never. You know, I'm up there in, in, in the, the loft. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, looks like we need some grapes. Come down and get some lemonade. It wasn't for him, it was for me. Do you know what, though? He understood that God's the one that's tireless. That God's the one that I can trust never runs out of gas. It goes on and says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, he understood that God soars above all. And God in that soaring would give him strength to help him soar as well. So that the tragedy, the struggles, the problems, the moves, whatever it is, he's able to ride above the problem in the pleasures of God, despite the problem. Again, I'm not saying it was always easy. I'm not saying he was always perfect. I know that he was aggravated when that bad hay came in. I know he was. But I want you to understand, he was always worrying more about the end result. And it brings blessings. Because see, when the blessing fades, 
And we're getting to celebrate a man who lived a wonderful life. Those tragedies are there. But he lived a wonderful life. He had so many great memories. He loves having his boys right there on the farm with him. He loves having family coming from all over the place and traditions of Thanksgiving and all the things that happen every year. He loved it. It's all the blessing from what he was and how he trusted God. He didn't become an angry old man at the loss. He didn't. He became a faithful, well-loved individual. And in the end, it brought great blessing. The soaring above. The ability to keep lovingly trying to put into his sons and then into his grandsons and his granddaughter. Trying his best to give them everything that he could about this faith and how real it is. We're going to sing now, Abide With Me. Another one of his favorites. Abide with me. That's number 440. Number 440 in your hymn book. Let's stand together as we sing.
What a blessing. Right? Got that right? Six more years. Okay. Don't scare me there. <laughs> um, so, glory in his salvation. His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. You know, one of the greatest uh, uh, glories that we have as parents are what our children become. And, and what their children become. Our children's children. And, and I'm sure we could all work on doing better for our parents' legacy, all right? But you see the hard work, you see the ethics, you see the desire to please the Lord, you see all of that in these young men. And, and I think that is an honor to Viva, because the Bible says that we're to honor in that fashion. They spend a lot of time at the house, spend a lot of time having over, spend a lot of time doing what they can, why? Because there's honor and majesty in this entire thing. From the Lord, the blessing of this family. For thou hast made him most blessed forever. Again, I think that fits him. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. Again, I think that is him. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Again, Everything he faced. I think when it comes to the end, and you and I look back at the life of Viva Viersma, what we see is a person who was not moved. He stuck with God all the way. And he loved his Lord. And I think we should never forget that and allow it to bring us to a place. Look, our world is, is a mess right now. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening. But our goal is to be grounded and anchored to Almighty God, just like Peter was. Amen. And to let that be what guides our every step and every motion in life, just like he did. And so what we're going to do is we're going to close with a word of prayer. And then after we close with a word of prayer, we're going to sing the doxology, which is something that he, he, he grew up with and they always sang at church and so on. So we're going to close with that because I felt that that was very fitting in the list of songs that he gave. And it's the last one he included as well. Um, but I, I thought it was very fitting for a church service that was meant to honor him. But I do want to tell you before we close in prayer and before we do that, that the family wants you to all be aware before we start moving and doing other things that after the internment in Gettysburg, we'll be meeting at the uh, Volunteer Fire Hall in Harney um, and to have some time together, okay? So that's about uh, partially between here and there, and uh, so, it, you know, we want you to come and be with us, all right? Uh, Hank, would you do the honor of praying? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us this moment to let go of what we have loved so dear. You give us this moment so that we realize what a mistake it would be that we were let go from you for all eternity. And you give us the shadow of death that we might never experience the true death separation from you. We ask, Lord, that in our going forth today, may our words be a cheer and comfort, uplifting and affirmation of all that is near and dear to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now let's stand and sing together number 21. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Tom, I just had a few announcements. We're prepared to go up to Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. Uh, we're going to go out on 140 and take a right. We're going to go in the procession. I just want to let everybody know which way we're going to go. We're going to take 140 into Westminster, get on Route 97, go north. Evergreen Cemetery is right before Gettysburg on the left-hand side. If you could turn your bright lights and four-way flashers on. At this time, if we could give the family a few minutes to say their goodbyes, we could just dismiss out the back. Thank you. Are you going